Boom! What's going on, everyone? I am Logan, the 64th Gear Jammer Skeel, and this is Toy Talk. Now, in my last video, we talked about the process that was required to make a single die-cast model car or truck to get it from onto your favorite store shelf or onto your own shelf. Now, today we're going to pick up where we left off. And if you remember right, we left off with pad printing and painting the detail on the models. Now, if you fit miss part one, please go back and search for my channel, Logan Skeel, and find it and view part one and catch up right before you can. Also, please take time to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that bell to keep notified of all of my videos. In part two, of this series what we're going to talk about is making the plastic parts that's what we didn't get to in the first video so now we're going to talk about it today now most all of your models today have some plastic parts there are very very few 100 percent all die cast metal models made they're out there but they're not many of them because a lot of the detail can't be done in die cast and definitely not economically in die cast Now the big question is this, do you want a unique toy collection that is the envy of all your friends and fellow collectors worldwide? If so, you have come to the right place to learn about all things die cast and resin. Follow along as I talk about the latest and greatest releases from the top manufacturers in the industry that will make your collection stand out from all the rest. My name is Logan, the 64th Gear Jammer Skeel, and this is Toy Talk. Now let's take a moment to go back and review all the machines that we talked about in the first video and this video so that we know where we're at and how much goes into making these models. First, we have the idea that comes into our heads. Then we need to get a computer. Then we need a 3D scanner. Then we need something to do rapid prototyping, such as a 3D printer. Then we need a CNC milling machine in order to mill out the molds. Then we need a heat treating machine to heat treat those molds. Next, we need another machine that's a high pressure injection machine that injects metal. That way we can die cast our model. Then we need a machine that will go out and round out and smooth off all those sharp edges on our model. Then we need a spray booth to, for painting. We need an airbrush and the equipment to run the airbrush. We need a pad printing machine and the necessary people to operate it. At my count, right now, we're at 10 people and we haven't even finished making all of our parts. Crazy, right? That's what we need to make a limited production or mass produced model. Either one, we need the same number of machines, the same number of parts. So now, what's next? Okay, what's next is that we need a plastic injection machine. This machine is to make all of our plastic parts such as our chassis, our bumpers, grills, wheels, uh, windshields, other parts that you might see that'll be hard plastic. Oh, all this just to make one model, and we're not even done yet. Now that we've reviewed what goes into making the die cast model and all the machines that are being used, let's begin today's topic. Now, we have a die cast shell of a model. It looks a lot like this. Not very detailed, right? It's missing tons of, tons of detail. That is where plastic parts come in. They can add that detail at a fraction of the cost of metal. So, we'll add on our undercarriage, our grill, wheels, bumpers, etc. Those parts are all great and they make the model stand out. So, but to make those, we have to go on to our plastic injection machine, which looks a little bit like this thing over here. Pretty cool, eh? Anyway, but before we can even get into that machine, we have to make yet another mold. <laughs> Go figure. Huh. More molds. Now, if you'll remember back in the first video, we talked about every part on our machine needs a mold cavity carved. Well, same goes for our plastic parts. If we need 100 parts, we need 100 mold cavities. And oftentimes, this will require making more than one mold simply because the molds can only hold so much space and so many parts in the machine. Now, so okay, now we've got this mold made. 
we put it in this machine that's just over my shoulder. It's a cool looking machine and it's simple. It works almost exactly the same as the die cast injection machine, only it works at a lower temperature. That's why these molds don't need to be heat treated like the die cast molds have to be heat treated. Anyway, what it does is it forces plastic into the mold under high pressure. Simple, right? Very simple process, and it's actually a very fast process. Sim because the temperature is down around 180 to 200 degrees, it can melt it quick and it can form up and solidify very quickly, making cycle times of you know six and seven cycles per minute, which can really crank out parts. That's why plastic parts are so cheap and so prevalent in basically all industries. I mean, you look around your home, you can't go without finding plastic injected parts. If you look in your car, you'll have a hard time seeing anything that isn't actually plastic injected part on the interior these days. That's how great this process is and how fast it is. Now this process is very much like the high pressure injection process. Plastic is melted into a molten state. The, a hydraulic ram closes the mold, compressing it together. The more pressure there, the less seam on the parts is visible. Then the molten plastic is forced under pressure into the mold. The mold is cooled, which solidifies the plastic. And once the plastic is solidified, you have a nice hard part. The mold is open and the part is ejected. All automatic. This process is pretty simple. It's just a, basically you punch in the number of parts you need and you walk away and let the machine work and it'll crank out that many parts as fast as it can. Now when we toured the Dyersville Ertl plant many many years ago it was after they had acquired AMT model kits. Now model kits are a great great example of plastic injection molding because what they do is they inject all the sprues with that have all the parts on them they bag them up, put them in a box, and sell them to the customer, and let the customer do final assembly. Now, this used to be really popular, but pre-made models have kind of pushed it aside. But there's plenty of enthusiasts who still like to build model kits. And if you haven't ever done it, I really highly recommend you give it a try someday. It's a lot of fun. It'll really let you know what all goes into making a model. And as you can see over here, we've got plenty of model kits you can choose from still available today and they're brand new. Round 2 Corp has been reproducing all of the old AMT truck kits. It's really cool. So you can go out and build your own tr model truck. Now anyway, back to the touring the plant. While we were at the plant, we walked through and we could see the line of plastic injection machines. It was 30 or 40 of them in a row and they were all just sitting there cranking out parts. The door would open, the guy would pull out a part, he'd close the door, hit the button, it inject, create a new part, you'd open the door, pull the part out, and so on, and so on. Now today, they're a little more automated than that, and one person can watch several machines, whereas back then, it was one person per machine. But still, at the cycle times, it was very fast and very efficient to make parts, and it was pretty cool to watch them work. Now anyway, back to what we're talking about. Now, when the parts come out of that machine, they're all attached to what is known as a sprue. Now, do you know what a sprue is? For those of you who don't know what a sprue is, a sprue is a channel through which metal or plastic is poured or injected into a mold. This can be either sand casting, die casting, lost wax casting, or more simply put, any type of casting has a sprue. Now, while it looks like this sprue would be a waste, and in a plastic model kit, it actually is waste material, but in production models, it's not wasted. What they do is once they clip the parts they want off, the sprue gets thrown into the bin. This one over here is a plastic sprue. When you can see on it, the car is still attached. Now, what they'll do with it is they'll cut our parts off of this sprue. You can see those little points right there where the parts that we want are attached. They'll clip those off, they'll sand those little points so they're nice and smooth, and then they'll send those parts off to either one of three bins. The first bin they'll send them to is the parts that are ready for assembly. That is, these are the parts that were injected in the color that we already want and they don't need any painting or plating at all. Plastic is a great material. 
we can inject it into any color we want so that it doesn't need painting. Now Bruder and Ertl, they do this with their big toys. They inject the plastic in the color they want them to be on the shelf and for the kids to play with. That way they don't have to paint. It also makes the parts very safe for the kids to play with because there's no paint on them for the kids to chew on. Great process, very simple. But not all parts can be injected in the color. Say we want a battery that's painted black and all the rest of the parts are white. So we inject the parts in the white and then we'll clip out the parts that we want painted black such as that battery. Now those parts will be thrown into bin number two and sent off to be painted. Yet another process for that. But in the last bin where we'll throw is the parts that want to be chrome plated or maybe even gold plated if we really want to go fancy. Now these would be wheels, bumpers, grills, etc. Those parts that we want to be flash plated with chrome. That way they really shine. Now they go in there. And generally though, what they do is they clip the sprue so the parts are still on the sprue. That way it hangs easily. It's a, it just makes the process easier if they've got the sprue there to hang. The chrome and gold plating is done by a process known as vacuum metallizing process. <laughs> Technical, right? It sounds very complicated, but it's actually pretty simple and yet requires yet another machine. But anyway, what is this process? Vacuum metallizing is a process that allows us to create a layer of metal onto a substrate. <laughs> complicated, huh? But it's not very complicated. It really isn't. It's simple. It involves heating the metal coating material inside a vacuum chamber until it vaporizes. The lack of pressure in this vacuum chamber is what drives the boiling point of the metal downward dramatically. This allows the metal to vaporize and then that vapor will then adhere to the substrate. Very simple. In this case, it, we're going to put it onto plastic. It can be put onto other things, but in the model world, plastic parts are the parts that are chrome plated. The parts that we need to have chrome or gold plated are sent to a special room, a clean room. In this room, those parts are hung on a tree and then sprayed with lacquer paint. This lacquer is very crucial to the process because that's what the metal will adhere to once it's in the vacuum chamber. Now, once the lacquer has dried, it is hung on a tree that looks a lot like this. Remember the shape, it's very important. I'll get to that later as to why, but they use that shape forever. Attached to these racks are electric wires, and also they attach teeny tiny little metal bars, and that's where our plating comes from. Once the racks are rolled into the vacuum chamber machine, it looks very much like this. Isn't that cool? Remember the cylindrical shape that from these racks? That's why they are. Now anyway, they go into that machine. Then they suck all the air out with a vacuum lowering it to the desired level. And remember from before, as they lower the pressure in the tube, they're lowering the boiling point of the metal in the machine. So once they get the right level, a switch is thrown, which sends electricity through the wires, vaporizing the metal bars. Now that vapor is then adhered quickly to the lacquered parts. And you have a chrome plated or a gold plated, depending on what kind of bars you put in the machine, piece. Very quick, very simple, almost like magic. Now, once they're plated, they open the machine up, they pull the parts out, and they send those parts to be clipped off the sprue, thrown in the bin, and off to final assembly. Those parts are ready. They're all shiny and flashy. Now, if it was a model kit, though, they just take the sprue, they bag it up, put it in the box, send it off to the customer, and let the customer do all the work. In summary, we've talked about all the machines that are necessary to make one model car or truck. Just one. Amazing, all these machines are required just to make that model that's sitting on your shelf. And we're not even done. But anyway, we've talked about the CNC milling machine. We've talked about the injection molding machine, the plastic machine. We've talked about the vacuum plating machine. We've talked about the airbrush, just to name a few of these machines. And let's not forget, all these machines take people to run. At my count, we're now up to 12 people, and we still haven't even finished making all of our parts. Because we still don't have tires, and we don't have any of the clear plastic parts yet. 
So just stay tuned for our next video. That's where we'll get into those parts because we're out of time for today. Now I've got this free report on resin versus die cast. It'll tell you what resin is, why you should have resin in your collection, and why resin is taking over the limited mass produced market. Grab it in the links in the description down below. Also, if you'd take time to like, comment, subscribe, and ring that bell to get notified of all of my videos. And if you know somebody who'd enjoy this, please share it with them. Thanks for watching. I'm Logan, the 64th Gear Jammer Skeel, and this is Toy Talk.